Okay, everybody. <laughs> Hello there. All right, how's the sound? Sound okay? Good, yeah, okay, very good. All right. <clears throat> So tonight we're going to talk about a teaching of uh, the Arizal Rabbi Yitzhak Luria, the famous Kabbalist, who is really in uh, many ways, or perhaps you could say even in every way, the father of modern Kabbalah. He lived in the 1500s, uh, born, actually born in Israel, born in Jerusalem. But uh, when he was a young boy, his father passed away. And his mother took him to live in Egypt, where his, um, where her brother lived, because her brother was willing to support the uh, young family. And uh, so he grew up uh, in Egypt, and then uh, later on uh, moved back to Israel and lived in the holy city of Safed, Tzvat, where he passed away at a very young age, uh, 39, he passed away. <coughs> um, Famous Arizal, he was many stories about him, many beautiful stories. Maybe one day we'll dedicate a lesson to telling stories. <laughs> Not today. But today's class also has to do with stories, as we will see shortly. Now, <clears throat> towards the end of this week's Torah reading, every week there's a portion that we read in the Torah. This week's portion is called Bo which means, literally translated, come. God says to Moses, come with Pharaoh. In other words, he goes with. Well, Moses goes with God rather than, um, he doesn't just tell him, you go to Pharaoh. It says, uh, let us both, so to speak, go to Pharaoh and uh, give the last warning, whatever. And anyway, in any event, in this week's uh, reading, it is the reading, uh, the, um, the, the main, main event probably, is the plague of the firstborn, where the firstborn Egyptians die, and the Israelites are finally uh, not only allowed to go, but even almost chased out of Egypt by Pharaoh and uh, his court. And uh, that is what we're going to focus on. Um, if someone doesn't have sound, uh, please just log out and log in again quickly. I don't think that anyone else is having a problem. <clears throat> okay. Or maybe turn your speakers on. <laughs> okay, so. At this time, before they actually depart from Egypt, before they actually, the, the Jewish people actually leave Egypt, God tells Moses to tell the Israelites to dedicate their firstborn to divine service. To dedicate their firstborn to divine service. In fact, um, this was meant to be the, it was actually historically the way it was, that generally the firstborn child in a family, the firstborn male in a family, took upon himself the religious obligations of the family. He sort of acted as the priest of the family, and that's the way it always was. Um, historically, even in, amongst the Jewish people, um, it was more or less like that. Um, until we get to the time of, um, until it get to the time of Jacob, that Jacob was actually born after his brother Esau, but Esau just wasn't um, um, appropriate for the divine service and didn't want it and uh, gave it up, in fact, and uh, so Jacob took it over. And that's the way it was, um, that the firstborn generally had um, done the divine service. And here it was sort of written in as a, um, as a requirement. Kadej li bechor, sanctify to me every bechor, every firstborn of your sons and your animals. Now, what that meant was, what that, what, that, what that means is that the, the animal either has to be offered as a sacrifice 
or redeemed, but children, the firstborn sons, are not offered as a sacrifice. Human sacrifice in Jewish, uh, in the Torah, is absolutely, absolutely forbidden. Human sacrifice of anybody, absolutely forbidden. But the um, the requirement is that the firstborn is redeemed. The firstborn is redeemed. Redeemed with a certain amount of money. In other words, a certain amount of money is given to charitable purposes. Nowadays, uh, it was it was always given to the Kohen, to the tribe of uh, the part of the tribe of the Levites, which were became the priests after the golden calf. But in any event, there was a requirement either to uh, make an offering, a uh, give an offering, an animal offering, or redeem the firstborn. Now, the communication from God to Moses, therefore, redeem the firstborn, or so rather sanctify the firstborn to God, which then had to be redeemed. Moses, however, immediately turns around and he goes to the people and he starts talking about something else entirely. (laughs) He starts talking about uh, liberation from Egypt and about how you have to teach your children, be guarded to Levincha, tell your children about what happened, about the miracles, and so on and so forth. And the question that Rizal asks is why on earth did Moses not immediately do what it was that God had told him to do which was sanctify the firstborn, tell the Jewish people about the sanctification of the firstborn. And then afterwards, he could have added uh, whatever other um, uh, communications he got from God afterwards. Why did he start off like this? Why did he, why did he uh, start off telling them about um, the, that, that they have to remember the exodus from Egypt and teach it to their children and so on and so forth? So the reason I have a very interesting answer. And uh, yeah, that's led to the fast of the firstborn afterwards. Yeah, right. On Erev Pesach, Eve of Pesach, Passover. So, the reason has a very interesting answer, and he says as follows. Mm-hmm. Moses, Moshe Rabbeinu, wanted very much to rectify the souls of the mixed multitude, the Erev Rav. Now, who was this mixed multitude? Where did they come from? Who were they? So, the mixed multitude were uh, were, were people that were also living in Egypt, some of them um, servants or workers of one sort or another, some of them possibly slaves, although the Arizal seems to uh, discount that. He says they weren't slaves, but in any event, um, some of them may have been uh, slaves of one sort or another, but not enslaved like the Jewish people were enslaved. Uh, the whole whole nation was individuals. We bought them slave market or whatever. And um, these people, when the when the Jewish people were led out of their bondage, when they were sort of kicked out or uh, told, you know, leave immediately. We don't want you here anymore. You're causing us too much uh, harm. With all the ten plagues and so on and so forth. So uh, what had happened was the um, the um, the the Erev Rav, these uh, this mixed multitude of people, these other people, um, went and um, decided to throw in their lot with the Jewish people and move uh, move with them out of Egypt, leave Egypt with them, and sort of cast their lot together with uh, with the Israelites at the time. Now, it seems, says uh, Rabbi Yitzhak Luria the Arizal, it seems that uh, Moses was particularly concerned for them and wanted to rectify them. Because, he says, they really came from the, they had similar qualities, they had similar qualities in them. How do they have similar qualities? So he explains that Moses was the aspect of Da'at of Chochmah. Da'at of Chochmah, which you could translate as knowledge within wisdom. 
And the Erev Rav, the mixed multitude of people, were people who derived from that original source even though they weren't there at the time. They weren't holding at the level of Dat of Chochmah, but that was their spiritual origin. Where did they come from? They came from the time when Adam, after the sin of the uh, tree of knowledge of good and evil, Adam separated from his wife, from Eve, from Chava, for 130 years. Quite a long time. <clears throat> In any event, during those 130 years, he, um, there were occasions in which um, there were drops of semen that escaped from him, called zerel batola in the uh, in the vernacular in Hebrew, zerel batola, and a wasted seed, and wasted seed emissions which were um, unintentional, and um, because they were part of him, they came from him, they came from Adam, so they were also there origin was the level of, also the level of Chochmah, and Dat of Chochmah, or your sort of Dat of Chochmah. In any event, they were very close to the root of Moses. So Moses, Moshe Rabbeinu, was very intent on making sure that these, these holy sparks, which had now been caught up in unholiness, in Klippa, in unholiness, would be able to become liberated. He was very concerned that they should be liberated, that should be taken out. Why was he so concerned with such a thing? Not only because they were part of his original source and he felt as if he was responsible for them because they came from the same original source, although he remained in holiness and they were buried in unholiness, but also because the complete redemption from Egypt could not really take place, or rather, let's put it this way, the redemption could take place without them. In other words, the redemption from Egypt, but the final going into Israel and building the Holy Temple required that all sparks of holiness be redeemed and be rectified and be uplifted. So he felt that if there was going to be a process which began with leaving Egypt and then moving towards and eventually entering the land of Israel and eventually building the Holy Temple in Israel, in the Holy Land in Jerusalem, so that would be either very difficult or impossible to do if there were still aspects of holiness which needed redemption. And even though they could possibly have been redeemed later, his calculation must have been that better redeem them while I have them right here, rather than afterwards when I have to go look all over the world for them, I have to go find, we would have to go find those sparks everywhere, they could be dispersed, they could be buried even more deeply, that could be buried so deeply that there was no possibility of redeeming them. And therefore, he took the chance, and instead of telling the Jewish people, the Israelites, about the commandment of sanctifying the firstborn, he began to speak about the whole concept of redemption and what redemption really means and what redemption is, uh, is all about. So these are some of the words uh, that he says. Remember the day when you came out of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. God took you there, it, uh, took you out of there, etc., etc. You're coming out in the months of spring, when God brings you to the land, the holy land, which he swore to your forefathers, a land flowing with milk and honey, etc., etc., um, then you will perform the uh, Passover ritual, the Passover feast, and so on. And then he says a very interesting thing, and he says, You shall tell your children on that day about what happened when God took you out of Egypt. 
you shall tell your children. In other words, if we just take a long sort of more philosophical view of the whole picture without looking at the Kabbalistic aspects to such a degree, what Moses was actually trying to do was he was trying to ensure the future. He was trying to make sure that the future, the building of the temple, the uh, entering first, entering into the land of Israel and the building of the temple and everything that would be there with the, the, the uh, official sacrifices that we would be able to bring for the Passover uh, sacrifices, etc., that that would be passed down through the generations by teaching your children. In other words, that reality of teaching our children, in other words, teaching the next generation, our children doesn't mean necessarily only our own biological children, but also teaching the next uh, generation. Oh, uh, sorry, you want the actual verse? The actual verse is chapter, it's Exodus chapter 13. It starts off at uh, verse, verse 1. Starts off chapter 13, verse 1, and then goes on from there. Yeah, I'll. Okay. Um, yes, they did leave with the Hebrews, in fact. And we see later on that the mixed multitude, in fact, were not ready for this whole thing. They did uh, create, they made the golden calf. They just weren't ready, which God already knew, but uh, <laughs> Moses did not. In any event, um, so what did he want to do? He wanted to ensure the future. How do you ensure the future? You ensure the future by instilling the whole concept in the next generation. What is the concept that we have to instill in the next generation? The concept that we are free people that we have left Egypt never to go back again. Leaving Egypt is not just a historical event. It's a cataclysmic spiritual event. Up until the time of the departure from Egypt, up until that time, the revelation of godliness in the world was limited. It was a limited revelation. Even the patriarchs and the matriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Sarah, um, Rivka, Rachel, and Leah, Leah, Rachel and Leah, all of them had limited revelation of godliness. In fact, in previous last week's uh, Torah reading, uh, God had said to Moses, I only appear to the patriarchs by my name Shin Dalad Yud, Shaddai. I only appeared to them in that name. That name has to do with creation. I only appeared to the patriarchs through creation. Through, true, there were miracles that happened to the patriarchs as well. There were many miracles that happened to the patriarchs. But those were miracles which were within the natural realm. There were miracles that took place within the natural realm and did not contradict the natural realm per se. It was only later on, after the Torah was given, that the exodus from Egypt was the beginning of the time of the giving of the Torah. Only then were we able to reach a sort of a transcendent, were we given this transcendent level of godliness. So instead of Moses telling them, sanctify the firstborn, because what does sanctify the firstborn mean? It means that there are certain people who have particular sanctity from birth without doing anything there for it. They were just born as the firstborn of the family. And by divine command, they gain a special status. Even if they aren't worthy of it, uh, worthy of it even if they're um, um, not very spiritual people, but they have a certain elevated divine status by virtue of their birth. Moses was very concerned about this and felt that if this was the first communication 
that he was going to give over to all of the people, including the mixed multitude of people, the Erev Rav, that were mixed in uh, with the Jewish people, there will be no possibility for their rectification. Why not? Because they would understand from this that sanctity is something conferred by God by virtue of birth and has nothing to do with your achievements. You can never achieve sanctity on your own. You can never get there yourself. It's something that has to be given to you and um, no one can give it to you if you aren't born at the right moment, if you aren't born as a firstborn. So Moses was very worried about this, besides the Arizal's explanation. He was concerned about this and felt that it would be much more appropriate to give as the first commandment, the first um, communication really from God that the people had received as a people something that they could grab hold of with both hands, something they could wrap their arms around as the expression goes something that they could do. He didn't want um, to introduce this whole new experience of the transcendent revelation of God, which had just begun, with something that is beyond our capacity to participate in, for the vast majority of people are not firstborn. And therefore, he started to speak about something that we can all relate to. He started to speak about the concept of moving oneself out of a state of bondage, a state of slavery, out of a slavery mentality. So he says, remember this day, remember the day that you came out of, uh, of Egypt, remember the day that you ceased to be a slave, and pass that memory along to your children. The only way to remain a free people is Vihigalatalavincha, tell your children. What do you tell your children? First, you have to tell them the story. You have to tell them the facts, you have to tell them what happened. You have to tell them about what our roots are, where we came from, what happened, what was the point at which the transition within us, the transition in the world in, 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 in many ways, but the transition for sure in the Israelites, happened when they became free people. This whole concept of freedom, of being free people, of no longer being in bondage, in other words, no longer being in a state of restriction, but now being in a state of openness to the very, very highest of, uh, of all levels, to a state of transcendence, that was when it began. And this is something that we must transmit to our children. It, it seems to me that the founding fathers of, the, uh, of this country, of, um, of America, understood that point very well. They understood that the concept that has to be passed down as the first and the most primal and, 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 and uh, foundational concept is that you are a free person. Don't wait for somebody else to tell you what to do and then you do it. That's a slave mentality. Slave mentality is you're passive. You're told what to do. What you have to do is you have to imbibe, you have to absorb the concept of freedom and seek it out and transmit it to others, transmit it primarily to your children. Now, your children doesn't only mean your children, it also means your students, your disciples, your family in general, in a, in a, in a, in a broad sense of family. You have to pass this concept on, this, this concept of we are a free people. The laws of men are important, but they don't grant freedom. They only regulate society. It's divine laws which grant freedom. 
following the dictates and listening in to tapping into the divine will is really what gives a person freedom. Now, one would think that that's ultimately, that's the ultimate constraint, that's the ultimate limitation, is I always have to live as a, uh, as a, uh, a, a servant, albeit a servant to God, but that's a servant nevertheless. So the, our sages tell us that that's not the case. When it says that the Ten Commandments were, it says that they were charut al haluchot. Charut means they were engraved onto the tablets of stone. The Ten Commandments were engraved onto the tablets of stone, scratched into the stone, engraved on the stone. So the sages say, don't read it as charut, engraved, but as cherut. What was engraved was freedom. Freedom was engraved in the soul. The concept of being who you really are and not being who society tells you to be, being who you are in the sense of understanding that the spiritual side of ourselves, the, the, the holy side of ourselves, the inner dimension of holiness that's within us cannot be constrained, even if our bodies are constrained. The previous uh, Lubavitcher Rebbe, Rabbi Yosef Yitzhak Schneerson, who was uh, imprisoned um, by the Russians and treated very, very brutally um, in, uh, in prison. He was tortured and all kinds of things like that. Um, he had said to his disciples, to his followers, even though the body goes into exile, in other words, even though he'll be in prison, the soul is forever free. The soul cannot anymore go into exile. It's been, it's been placed in a state of freedom. The only way the soul can go back into exile is if a person goes willingly. In other words, he, he or she takes upon themselves a slave mentality instead of a, the mentality of a free person. And naturally now, we have this concept of what it means to be free. That freedom is engraved on our souls to be a free person. That means that what one does is all by your choice to fulfill the purpose for which you were created. That's what freedom really means. Fulfilling the purpose for which you were created. No one can prevent you from that. You're free to do that. Does it mean that you're free to, to do just do anything you want? Well, really nobody's going to stop you unless it's illegal, obviously. Nobody's going to stop anyone from, from doing uh, crazy things. But that's not freedom. You'll see that the most unrestricted, uninhibited, un, uh, un, let's call them the most undisciplined people uh, who, you know, who go wild um, are, are not very free people at all. They're not very happy people at all. You know, the Miley Cyruses of this world and, uh, and so on and so forth. Need I say more? <clears throat> yes? Um, so, freedom, therefore, is an inner spiritual state in which we're given the opportunity, we're given the possibility of pursuing our own inner dream, our own inner purpose, our own inner um, sense of what, what, what we are here for. Okay, so... This is why Moses, Moshe Rabbeinu, wanted this to be the first message that he would give to the Jewish people, or to the people as a whole, rather. Rather than the message of certain souls are appointed by God for a very specific and elevated function, and no one else can be like that. If you're not born that way as a firstborn, you, you, there's no way that you can fulfill that duty. There's no way that you can play that role. 
Instead of that, sort of the restrictive and exclusive type of role, Mo Moses wanted to give, give everybody an inclusive role, that you too have a purpose in this world. You too have a, um, a target to move towards. You too have the ability to communicate this message to others, to your children, to your disciples, to your larger circle of friends, and so on and so forth, about what it means to come out of Egypt, to be a free person. And this is the message that you have to give over. So therefore, what Moses did was somewhat audacious, you might say, you might think, but was nevertheless effective. Wasn't entirely effective with the uh, mixed multitude because afterwards they did go on to, uh, to worship the golden calf, exactly what he was afraid of and exactly what he wanted to try and avoid. But nevertheless, because something doesn't work, doesn't mean to say you shouldn't try. Uh, if there's a possibility that something will, uh, will work, you still have to try. Even if it's not a 100% possibility. One's going to wait for the 100%, um, you know, basically they'll do nothing in the world. You've got to take chances to do the right thing. And if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. Um, which might be disappointing, but nevertheless is, uh, is part of reality as well. Okay, so that's the message for tonight, for, the, uh, for this week's parasha. It begins with the concept of Bo, I'm coming with you to Pharaoh. And then Moses tells the people, you have a function, you have a purpose in the broader scheme of things. And even though there is, at times, designated roles of holiness for different people that not, are not accessible to anybody else, that doesn't have to concern you because you can go to the Holy Land and you can build help to build the temple in any way that you are capable. And that's a contribution which everybody is capable of doing. I'm speaking in figurative terms, obviously. It's a contribution that everybody is, uh, is, has the possibility to give. And not only has the possibility, but really has the obligation. And that's what the, um, was going through Moshe Rabbeinu's mind, what he was thinking at the time that he reversed, he switched around the commandments. Okay, any questions, folks? Seems like no freedom without enlightenment. Uh, because without enlightenment, uh, how could we know our truest purpose? Um, a person does not have to be completely enlightened to be able to figure out what it is that he's here for. Yes, it's true, perhaps. Uh, it is true that as a person becomes more and more enlightened, um, the purpose changes and it seems to move, uh, you know, it's sort of a moving horizon, so to speak. That's true. As you climb one hill, you see the next hill in the distance and then you climb the next one and so on and so forth. That's true. Uh, but that doesn't mean to say that you have to know the end, the final end point from the beginning. I can say in my own life, and I'm only speaking for myself, but I probably would guess that it's true of most people, that as uh, the years have gone by, I'm only 17, as you understand. <laughs> um, as the years have gone by, um, I've my goal has changed somewhat. My, you know, what I feel my purpose has uh, changed somewhat. Not completely, but, uh, you know, the direction, the way in which it's expressed um, has changed. And you don't need to be enlightened for that. Uh, Yael asked, was Moshe, in order to actually change the order of the message, my question is, did Mahashem know this in the order? 
are important instead of the order he told Moshe. Um, and of course, God knew uh, which, which was the better way to go about things because he knew that the mixed multitude would not be there that affected by it. But it doesn't mean that Moses made a mistake. He understood things from the human point of view. And uh, um, sometimes um, we see that Moses and Abraham and uh, many of the great uh, and many of the great um, saints of the Bible actually argued with God. They argued with God and um, sometimes prevailed. There's the famous story, I think I might have mentioned it to you before, um, not 100% sure, but the famous story of Rabbi Eliezer, Rabbi Eliezer. This is a time that is told. This is a story that is told at the time of the the Mishnaic period, first second centuries, um, before the Talmud in itself was written. The Gemara that it was written. Uh, this was the time of the Tanoim, the Tanaitic period, which uh, would lasted from before, um, let's say. Um, a hundred years before the common era until 200 years after the common era during the time of the Roman rule and so on and so forth. It's about 300 year period approximately. In any event, the story is told of the great Rabbi Eliezer, the great, great, great sage. And one day a person came to him, his name was Achnai. Achnai. Now, Achnai was an inventor, a Jewish inventor. And he figured out a system, he figured out an idea that how to avoid ritual impurity of ovens. If an oven became ritually impure, it had to be smashed and uh, then a new one built in its place. But he figured out a way how to um, avoid ovens become ritually impure, becoming ritually impure and uh, not to avoid them becoming ritually impure, but how to rectify them without completely destroying them and starting over and making new, the ovens were made out of clay in those days. What did he do? He made an oven that was modular, right? It could be taken apart. And if it's taken apart, it's not really called an oven. So it's just pieces now. So once it's in pieces, uh, the modular oven, all you have to do is take it apart and put it back together again, and then you have your oven the way it was. So he went to the great Rebbe Eliezer, and he said to Rebbe Eliezer, um, this is what I've done, and is it kosher? So Rebbe Eliezer was uh, delighted with it, and he said, yeah, indeed, it is, uh, it is kosher. But as... Um, you know, many entrepreneurs will, uh, will do, they don't want just one uh, stamp of approval, they have to have several because that way it gets more, uh, you know, you can sell more, um, you can sell more items that way, you can sell more ovens that way. So he went to various other sages in the, in the study hall and he asked them and they said, no, it's no good. So then an argument ensued between Rabbi Eliezer and uh, the other sages. Now, let me just explain something for, uh, for those of you who are not familiar with uh, Jewish practice. One of the ways in which knowledge advances is through disputation, disagreement, argument. There's a way of resolving arguments, and that is we go according to the majority opinion. If the majority of the sages say one thing, then the opinion of the minority is nullified, and the minority has to follow the opinion of the majority. It's like just like uh, you know, in uh, in a in a court of um, uh, in a court, in a courts in a modern court system, the majority makes the decision, right? They decide according to the majority. In any event, so uh, the sages started arguing uh, about which uh, opinion was correct: was it Rabbi Eliezer's or the other sages, including Rabbi Yeshua? And Rabbi Eliezer, in arguing with him, said, "If I am right." let the river that runs past the study hall reverse its course and run uphill. And they went outside and they saw that the river was, had suddenly reversed and was flowing upwards. Obviously a miraculous event, which uh, I don't suggest you try with your bathwater. 
In any event, um, the sages then say to Rabbi Eliezer, as I said, the rivers don't prove anything. Right? The way the rivers run doesn't prove anything. So uh, he, he, he then said, if I'm right, let the carob tree that is outside the study hall move 100 meters away. And it did. And they said, a carob tree doesn't prove anything. Then he said, if I'm right, let the walls of the study hall cave in. And Rabbi Yeshua, who was on the other side, said, no, they may not cave in. So they already started to cave in. And uh, at that point, they, they stood, they sort of stood still, uh, but partially caving in, but not falling, uh, not falling completely in. So the walls of the study hall became sort of um, bent. They weren't straight up anymore. In any event, last chance, Rabbi Eliezer cries out, if I'm right, let God himself uh, rule that way. And a voice came out of heaven, what they call a bus call, which is a sort of an echo. An echo came out of heaven and said, Rabbi Eliezer is right. Why are you disagreeing with him? And the rabbi stood up and said, the law is that the opinion goes according to the majority, and therefore we don't have to accept what it says in heaven. The Torah was not, is not in heaven anymore. It was given to us. It was given to Moses. It was given to the Jewish people. And we now rule according to the rules of the Torah, according to the rules of logic and so on and so forth, the rules of disputation. We're ruling that the oven is not kosher. And another voice came out of heaven, out of heaven and said, Nitzchuni, bona Nitzchuni, you have defeated me in argument, my children. You have defeated me in argument. Right? Now, that message to communicate to your children that you could also be wrong, even though you're the adult, and sometimes they could be right, that too is a message which we have to impart to our children. It is one of the things that you'll, that you'll see. It's, it's, a very, it's a startling thing that to see that there's a tremendous amount of disputation and argument and discussion that goes on in Jewish families. Uh, and it's not argument of the vicious type. It's more argument about ideas. Well, hopefully anyway, about ideas. And it's not necessarily true that the, um, that the father always wins the argument. The children will respect the father for the argument, but uh, but I'll give you a little story. Just tell you a little story. There was a, a great Hasidic uh, Rebbe and his son were sitting and uh, and and discussing a tractate of the Talmud and passage, and they had a disagreement as to uh, how to interpret it. And the father said one way, and the son said a different way. So um, they were arguing backwards and forwards, and the and the son uh, the, the the son said. Uh, he shouted out, I'm right, and you'll know that I'm right. And then the father, who felt that his son was being a bit rude, said, uh, so don't ever come into my house through the front door. Don't ever come through my front door again. And um, so the story is told that afterwards, uh, the son, when he would come to visit, would come in through the window. He wouldn't come in through the, wouldn't come in through the door <laughs> to respect his father. In any event, to be able to give our, over to our kids that they have to inquire for themselves. It's not just what's handed down to posterity that's important. Of course, what's handed down is important, but you have to make your own inquiries into things. You have to require it for yourself. That's part of the message that we're talking about. So we even argue with God, right? As you saw, uh, the rabbis sort of, so to speak, argued and God was pleased with it, and he said, yes, you defeated me this time, right? You ruled according to the rules of the Torah, and that's fine. Abraham argued with God. Job argued with God. One of the famous stories that came out of a recent, um, a recent generation, uh, just two generations ago, is a story told by Elie Wiesel, the famous Nobel laureate, who happened to be in, uh, as a child, as a young, a young man, not a child, but as a young man in Auschwitz, in the, in the terrible concentration camp in Auschwitz. So he tells a story that he said he would one day write, maybe he's written it subsequently, but he always told the story 
which he said one day when he writes it, it's going to be called a trial. And that's exactly what it was. The sages that were in the camp at the time, great Kabbalists, great Talmudists, uh, the heads of academies, uh, important rabbis, very uh, learned and wise people, put God on trial. They looked at every type of uh, relationship that the Torah talks about between mankind and God, between the Jewish people and God, whether, so to speak, God is the father and we're the children, whether he's the husband and we're the wife, whether he's the master and we're the slave, and the servant or the slave, whether he, we are colleagues, whether whatever, whatever relationship you might want to, want to um, uh, look into. And they examined the Torah obligations of all types of relationships. What does the Torah say about a relationship of a father to a son? What are the obligations of a parent to a child? How do we understand those obligations? Are those obligations ever, is, are there limits to those obligations? Is the obligation ever abrogated to such an extent that a parent can just let a child drown or be, be, uh, be killed uh, and so on and so forth? Anyway, they looked at it from every which angle that you can imagine and the disputation went on for weeks. The discussion went on for weeks, looking at every angle, both in God's favor and in the favor of the people. The Jewish people who were in the camps at that time and suffering terribly. Eventually, they came to a conclusion. The head of the uh, court, the court that they'd uh, convened over there, the head of the court, a very, very respected and important rabbi, stood up and he says, gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, we have reached the verdict. And the verdict is guilty. Now it is time to go and say the afternoon prayers. So you see, even though we don't always think the way God thinks and we don't understand the way God understands and sometimes we dispute his uh, decisions, nevertheless, when it comes to the time for the afternoon prayer, we have to say the afternoon prayer. It's time for the afternoon prayer, ladies and gentlemen. The sun is going down. We have to go pray the afternoon prayer. And uh, that, is the, that is the attitude. That's the attitude of holiness. That's the attitude that Moses wanted to inculcate in all of the Israelites and all of the people who, um, uh, who are coming out of Egypt at that time. The idea that we're working towards a purpose. Each person has his own um, uh, function within the, this grand scheme of things, within the grand purpose. And um, we're entitled to and even sometimes required to uh, argue with God about that and always constantly move forward and don't regard ourselves as something separated and, uh, and, uh, and given um, that we were given a certain status that wasn't earned. Um, we have to earn our status. We have to earn um, and deserve to be who we are. Uh, and that's really the message, I think, that the, uh, one of the messages, certainly, that the Arizal uh, wanted to get across to us. Okay, any more questions? Uh, you can't seem to recall when Abraham uh, argued with Hashem about the destruction of Sodom and Amora. He wanted to destroy, and Abraham said, wait a second, if there's uh, righteous people in the city, and so on and so forth, there's 50 righteous people, 40 righteous people, and so on. Yeah? Okay. Expound on earned. There is a concept in the Torah called Namahad, na, it's actually mentioned in the Zohar, Nahamad Dichisufa, the bread of shame. What's the bread of shame? The bread of shame is the bread that you get as a handout, a welfare check, so to speak. If God gives you whatever he gives you as a handout and you don't work towards it, you don't deserve it, you don't, uh, it's just given as a handout, then you really have not done anything major with uh, your life. And um, it's not, whatever you get is not necessarily earned. We see there's a, just to give you an example of a case recently, um, there was a case of, uh, I don't remember all the details, but there was a, a young boy who uh, was driving his car and he drove recklessly and he killed people. And the, the lawyer's argument uh, to the court, which was a successful argument, was that he was affected by affluenza. Yeah, affluenza means he came from a very, very affluent family, 
very, very wealthy family where like he didn't, you know, to the extent that everything was always done for him, he didn't understand what he was doing. Um, and uh, unfortunately, there are people like that. Um, that. They behave that way and have very little regard for the feelings of other people, for the needs of other people, and so on and so forth. And uh, that's kind of the bread of shame. You know, we, if, we, if, we, if we don't deserve, if we don't work to deserve what it is that we have, all the good things in our lives, if we don't really, if they were just handed to us on a, on a, on a silver platter or a golden platter, uh, well, it's nice that we got them, but let's, let's deserve them. Let's do things that earn us the right to have that, so to speak. Like actually speak louder than words. Yeah, that would be, uh, if I win the lottery. <laughs> Don't give it all away. You can give some of it away. It's no obligation to give everything away, Terry. If you win the lottery tonight, um, you have a number of members of your colleagues over here will be lining up. <laughs> but if you do win the lottery tonight, don't give it all away. Give, you, give, you can give a fair amount, 10%, 20%, whatever it is. A fifth is, uh, is, is the most generous um, measure that most people would be uh, you know, very happy giving and certainly for people accepting. 10%, 20%, whatever. Um, yeah, a parent or child will give before the child even asks for it. That's true. That is true. But if we spoon feed our children, unfortunately, I think this is what's happened uh, to a large extent in this country. We spoon feed our children to the extent that they, they remain children now until they're 25 or 30. Um, and that's, you know, that's just not, it's not the way things should be. A person should, even children should learn to earn their keep for a child to go out and get a, you know, a part-time job so that he can make himself pocket money, even if the parents can afford to give him as much as he needs or she needs. Um, nevertheless, I do believe that it's important for the child to learn the value of money by earning it. 